Hello everybody, welcome to the channel, thank you for joining me. Today is going to be the first part of a new series. I mean, when, when, when do we ever continue series? We only ever start them on this channel. So it's the first in a brand new series, and I think this is going to be a very popular one. I'm going to be looking at Napoleon's Imperial Guard. And this video is going to be covering the Young Guard. The Young Guard were founded just in time for the 1809 campaign and were originally called the Conscript Grenadiers and the Conscript Chasseurs. And that's something in common with all the different types of Imperial Guard infantry. You have, you know, what's effectively light and heavy, so Chasseurs and Grenadiers. Now on the battlefield, they didn't actually make that much difference. It was just minor details on the uniforms, colours of the epaulettes, things like that, that changed between them. But they were both very much used as either shock troops, so the traditional grenadier role, or they could also be used as skirmishers as well. They were trained to be a little bit more independent of thought than uh, others. And if you've seen the video on the French infantry, you'll see that that was something that the French infantry did very well. It comes out of that sort of revolutionary tradition of being able to think for yourself almost, and that's where the French ability to both fight in close column or line or even in skirmish order was uh, so successful. So who made up the Young Guard? Well, they were drawn from the cream of the crop of every year's conscripts and volunteers. In fact, the 1st and 2nd Regiment, when they were founded, so the 1st Terralier Grenadiers and the 1st Terralier Chasseur, now, I'm almost certainly pronouncing that wrong there, but uh, I think that should be no surprise to anyone who's seen any videos on this channel. So, the first Terralier Grenadier, the first Terralier Chasseur, they were originally called Grenadier Conscripts and Chasseur Conscripts. And there's quite a funny story that the regiment would have the guard chasseurs in letters that are two foot high on the side of their wagons, and then have conscripts in like super tiny letters at the bottom of it. Because they were, you know, made up of conscripts. You know, there's no two ways about it. And I think in wargaming and in history, we sort of give a bit of a bad rep to conscripts. We assume that, you know, if you're a conscript, you've got low morale and low skills. And that's not necessarily the case. I mean, the German army in the First World War was a conscript army. And I don't think anyone would suggest that that was a very poorly trained army. So I think it's something that maybe we mischaracterized but it's certainly something that was mischaracterized back then and in fact just before the young guard was sent to spain there were quite a number of duels fought between young guard officers and other officers because they felt they weren't being given the the due respect that an imperial guard formation deserved so despite being conscripts there were some standards for joining the young guard that were higher than just joining the regular line so uh, one of the things with that was that the height requirement was 163 centimeters in 1809 so that's when it first started and that was the absolute minimum so i mean that's pretty tall if you were on the shorter end of that then you would probably go into the chasseurs taller guys would go into the grenadiers now the old guard were the only units in the imperial guard infantry to wear bear skins so the young guard is still wearing shakos they're quite heavily decorated shakos they're quite cool actually but uh, they're still not like the iconic bearskins. Quite interesting there, because even at the time, line grenadiers would be wearing bearskins. So that kind of sets them apart from even line grenadiers to an extent. Another requirement was that the soldier had to be literate. Now, to us today, that might sound like, well, you know, everyone's literate. Well, you know, most people are in this day and age. But back in the Napoleonic period, being literate was actually quite rare, especially for, you know, the hoi polloi that would form the conscript classes but it's an important thing to have in a young guardsman we'll get on to the role of officers and who they were and where they came from in a bit but it kind of fits in with that because it's about that path to promotion so something that was essential for ncos certainly senior ncos was being literate and the young guard was something of a almost like a hothouse for creating soldiers who would go on to be senior NCOs in either other guard regiments or maybe even other infantry regiments. And obviously the first part of that is being literate. So when they were formed, the Terralier Grenadiers and the Terralier Chasseurs, there were two regiments of each. 
So you've got the first Terralier Grenadiers, second Terralier Grenadiers. Nothing too uh, groundbreaking there. And each one of those regiments would be formed the same as a French infantry one. So six companies, roughly a hundred, between a hundred and a hundred and forty men, and they were they would form a battalion. Three battalions made a regiment. Now, with some of the other nations, like the British, for instance, they often had a depot battalion which would stay at home and that would feed reinforcements to the troops on the front line. Well, for the Imperial Guard, and the Young Guard in particular, they had regiments that were separate, but they fulfilled that role. And they were known as the Conscript Grenadiers and the Conscript Chasseurs. And they would obviously, you know, feed into the Terralier Grenadier and Terralier Chasseurs, respectively. So when we're looking at 1809, the Young Guard consists of four regiments, uh, two of each. And that was something that was hugely expanded on as the Imperial Guard grew towards the end of the period of the Napoleonic Wars. And I think it's something that I'd quite like to do a discussion video on about was the Imperial Guard actually a net drain on resources for the army? I think it's a subject that's quite an interesting one because I think there's arguments to be made both ways. During the preparation for the 1812 campaign, they added more regiments of grenadiers and chasseurs. So they would eventually have six regiments in 1812. During the retreat from Moscow, the guard, along with all the rest of the French army and their allies, were absolutely decimated. And when rebuilding his army, Napoleon actually created 16 regiments of young guards. So, I mean, that's a huge amount. Now, it must be said that they weren't the same strength as the regiments were in 1809, they were a lot smaller. I mean, on paper they were supposed to be, but I don't think they ever really reached that height. But as we'll go on to look at towards the end of the video, some of their actions in the 1813, 1814 Battle for France were pretty incredible. They were um, they were no slouches when it came to fighting in the field. So we looked earlier on at the men who made up the rank and file of the Young Guard. But what about the men who led them, the officers? Now, it's quite an interesting thing in France that, as I argued in the video on French infantry, they weren't perhaps as good soldiers as many of the other nations. I'm thinking particularly of Austria or Prussia. I think the British and the Russians had advantages over the French. But the one thing that the French, well, one of the many things that the French excelled in were their officers. And the French Napoleonic cadre i guess you could say had the first military school uh, well the first modern military academy i guess you could say at saint cyr and a posting to the young guard direct from saint cyr would only have been given to the officers who finished top of their classes they really were the high flyers of the french napoleonic army these were guys who were destined for glory as napoleon would have said perhaps they had marshals' batons in their backpacks. So now we've covered who the Young Guard were, where they were conscripted from, or where they were recruited from, I guess, and who their officers were. And now it seems a reasonable time to look into what the Young Guard actually did, what their role on the battlefield and in France's Napoleonic army was. And it's quite an interesting one. It's quite different from the rest of the Guard, because Napoleon actually used them, which is certainly a lot more than he did. The old guard, oh, I mean, that's a little unfair. They did uh, fight in some actions. But they were often his first reserve that he would send in. So perhaps one of their most famous early engagements was the Battle of Aspernesling. And they were deployed on the right flank of the French army. So they were between the Danube River and the village of Essling. And that was a, a bit of a sort of open ground area that Austrian cavalry could have you know, outflanked the strong point of the French army and perhaps rolled up the line, cutting the lines of communication back to the uh, the other side of the river or Lobo Island. So that was one of their first real engagements and it was a key turning point in the battle. Without their presence there and without them holding the Austrians back, it could have ended very differently for Napoleon. I think there's a very strong argument to say that Napoleon lost that battle, but he didn't lose his army. And I think had the young guard not have held that flank, it really could have ended differently for the army. And this carried on. They were very much seen 
as the shock troops of Napoleon. When the enemy were wavering, they would be sent in to deliver the coup de grace, or they could also bolster shaky lines. They were often also used as the tip of the spear. Something Napoleon liked to do would be attack in what was considered to be a defensive battle for the French. This is how he was able to hold off the different Allied armies in 1813 and 14. And at the Battle of Dresden in particular, the young guard were, as I say, the tip of the spear. They were really at the forefront of the battle. And the first Triallier Grenadiers attacked six Prussian battalions and smashed through them all. Uh, now, this is not the Prussian army of 1806. This is the Prussian army that would go on to fight the Battle of Waterloo. So it's a much more modern for the time in training, tactics, maneuverability, things like that. But still, but still, one regiment of French Terralier Young Guard managed to smash through six Prussian battalions. They were actually awarded a hundred crosses of the Légion d'Honneur for that battle alone. And I think that really goes to show, all right, Napoleon may have been trying to bolster the morale of troops during a very bad time, but that's to take nothing away from the individual bravery of those young guardsmen. And later on, you know, this carried on throughout the entire battles for France. In 1814, the Battle of Lutzen, which was the biggest battle in history when it happened. And um, there's a quote from Chapelowski who says, The Emperor drew his sword, placed himself between the two columns of young guard, and advanced through the resulting gap towards Kaja. The young guard stormed the village without firing a shot and ejected the enemy with the bayonet. And that's very much what the young guard were about. They were these shock troops that Napoleon would use, as I say, either as the tip of the spear or they would be used to bolster a failing defence. Something which the retreat from Moscow did. And it's a surprisingly positive, I guess, side effect of such a disaster is that the troops who survived were the absolute hard core of the French army. And while the young guard were built up from new conscripts, people who were too young or not perhaps as qualified as they could have been to join the young guard during the Russian campaign, but those who did survive, who became the NCOs, the senior NCOs, the officers, these guys were really hardened. And it meant that during these battles in the Battle for France, they were absolutely able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the best that the Allies had to offer. That said, by 1815 in the Battle of Waterloo, the Young Guard was in pretty poor shape, to be fair. they um, Only five out of the 16 regiments were able to participate in the Hundred Days campaign, and they were made pretty much of... Uh, not the dross, I think that would be a little bit harsh, but men who were perhaps not as well disciplined as they could have been, shall we say. And some of the battalions were under General Lamarck, who you may remember from our Vagram video, or possibly Les Miserables, which, whichever one. He's the, uh, the general whose death inspires the, um, the revolt. But anyway, some of the Young Guard regiments were under him in the Vendée, doing a kind of policing action against local insurrectionists, I guess you would call them. And he complained that they were filled with, quote, recruits and deserters who neither knew how to manoeuvre nor to shoot. As I've said in other videos, this is a wargaming channel, not a history channel. So how do different wargaming rules, and in particular Black Powder, represent the Young Guard? Well, normally they are a class above the line infantry. So if you're playing something like in the Grand Manor, then they would be B-class as opposed to the line being C-class. And I think that's really just to allow the old guard grenadiers to be that much above the young guard. And I'm not 100% sure that that really fits into what their battlefield performance was. I think that rather underestimates the quality of the young guard. In Black Powder, they have two rules that mark them out as different to being the line. The first is Elite 5 Plus. Now, that's the same as a combined Grenadier Battalion would have. So, I, I think that's fair enough. I think that a standard regiment, or battalion, sorry, of Young Guard is probably equivalent to the Elite of the line. I think that's reasonable. 
And in the Albion Triumphant Volume 1 book, when they fought in Spain, they also have the skirmish special rule. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier on at the beginning of the video, that they could operate either individually or in close formation as well. One of the things that the Young Guard were used for in Spain was anti-guerrilla operations. They were stationed in Burgos, so they were quite far away from the actual fighting. But they would go out in small patrols, patrol the area, keep down Spanish guerrillas, things like that. So I think that really suits their, um, their abilities there. Uh, they have actually the same stats for Clash of Eagles in 1812 and the Battle of Waterloo as well. And I'm not really sure that that's super accurate. I think, I think a Young Guard battalion in 1809 is a much better formation than a Young Guard Battalion in 1815. I think that's one of the problems with having a D6 based system, is there's not really enough flexibility there to make them vastly different. I guess you could give them Elite 4 Plus in 1809 perhaps, have them slightly better than a Line Grenadier formation. Perhaps you could even give them something like Reliable, I mean I know they get that from being in Column of Attack, but it would mean that they'd also have it in Line as well doesn't really fit with what we read about Napoleon sending them into the village uh, just to use the bayonet. But, you know, I think it would mark them out as being something a bit special. They'd lose that by 1815, arguably by 1812 as well. Although, ironically, that's one of their special rules in the Clash of Eagles book. So I'm not entirely sure where the author's getting that from. I guess I suppose it's, you know, him saying that they've been hardened by a few years of warfare and things like that but eh, you know yeah okay fair enough so i think there is room in there for a little bit of tweaking with the young guard i can understand why they didn't but for me i would like to have seen a little bit more differentiation between the battalions of 1809 and the battalions of 1815 another special rule they could have had i guess would be tough fighter especially if you're fighting maybe dresden or lutzen you could give them that special rule just for that battle, and that really would represent them clearing out villages with the bayonet, things like that. When we talk about the old guard, which we'll be doing uh, probably not soon enough, I think is uh, my suspicion, we'll talk about a bayonet charge they did. It's one of my favourite incidents of the Napoleonic Wars, because it's just... the imagery is just phenomenal. But anyway, that's uh, that's a subject for a different video. So what I'm going to try and do in this series is I'm going to try and go between the Guard Infantry and the Guard Cavalry. I'm kind of starting off with my least favourite. I think it would be safe to say that's yeah, a little bit harsh on the old Young Guard there. But yeah, who doesn't love the old Guard? And I think when I do the Guard Cavalry, I'll start with the Light Cavalry. So that will probably be the next video in this series. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to be the next video. I want this series to be sort of running along in the background. I'm not 100% sure what the next video is going to be on. I've had a couple of ideas about adding additional rules and maybe, uh, maybe making quite a fundamental change to the rules. That's probably going to be the next video. The one about the additions will probably be the video after that. And then maybe we'll be looking at the Imperial Guard Light Cavalry. Or maybe I'll do even another nation focus. I'm very keen to do Prussia, but I don't know much about Prussia. Prussia, I know kind of a bit about of 1806. But by the time we get to the invasion of Russia, where they obviously fought alongside the French. And then when they flipped sides and fought against them. And then the Battle of Waterloo. I am the first one to admit I do not know a huge amount about that army. If one of you out there does, and you'd be interested in doing a collaborative video, leave a comment down below, or send me a message, and we'll see what we can do. I'd really like to have a few more interviews and things like that on this channel, because, yeah, I'm sure you're all sick of just the sound of my voice. It'd be nice to have a bit of counterpoint and just hear someone else's opinion. But all that said, thank you so much for listening. Um, please, if you enjoyed this video, please like, share and subscribe. I know I say this at the end of every video, but it really does help the channel grow. 
Uh, if you didn't like the video, well, thank you for staying with it this long. Uh, leave a comment down below about how you think I can improve next time because this is always a work in progress. I hope that you can join me for the next video. And until then, goodbye.